I'm glad. If you're not uplifted when we get to that chorus, oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. And there might be somebody in here tonight just wondering whether or not he cares. Listen to the words. Oh yes, he cares. And there are people in here that know he cares, and you can know that he cares too. And uh, I'm, I'm, I sure am thankful for that. Um, we're going to get into God's Word tonight. Let me ask you to uh, turn with me to uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. Let's just go on there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> and uh, while you're turning there, I, I want to put a disclaimer out there. In, in the course of this message, I'm going to say quite a few things that are not going to be very politically correct, okay? But that's all right, because everything I'm going to tell you is going to be very biblically correct, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll be able to stand on good ground here, but I'm just going to tell you, there's some people in our world and society that aren't going to really care for uh, what I'm preaching. Uh, all year long on Sunday nights, we've been focused on a God who is high and lifted up. Let me just help you with that. Whether you are lifting him up or not does not matter. He's still high and lifted up. <laughs> whether people acknowledge him, whether people exalt him, whether people treat him like God doesn't matter. He is still high and lifted up above all things. And so if you're our guest tonight, we are the theme for our church for the year has also been the subject of our Sunday night uh, meetings. Uh, high and lifted up, a year of challenging our thinking about God. And we have, haven't we? we our thinking has really been challenged about God and, and who He is. And we've uh, talked about who He is and His character and His attributes. And a little over a month ago, the sermon series took an abrupt change. But I signaled, so it's okay. I didn't turn without signaling. But instead of preaching about the attributes of God, and I've not been the only one doing the preaching, and I'm not going to be the only one preaching to finish this thing out, but, um, the, but the, instead of focusing just on the attributes of God, the corner that we've turned now is now to turn the focus on God's children to say that if God, who lives within us, is of a certain character, then shouldn't we see that character on display in our life? So a couple weeks ago, we looked at, uh, we looked at, uh, this has been about three weeks ago, we looked at, um, what word did we look? We, we were in there. 1 Peter chapter 1, as it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So because God is holy, God's people ought to be holy. And then uh, two weeks ago, we saw where God is eternal. And if the eternal God lives within us, and we now have eternal life, then the challenge was this, then shouldn't we as God's children live like we have eternal life? And not just live for the temporal things and what's in front of us and the fulfillment of our five senses and things like that, but shouldn't we live like we're going to live eternally? And that's where we focus. Last week, I heard a great message from Brother Trevor Reynolds, who was passing through. Uh, I'm still amazed by that. On Sunday morning, I brought up a Bible story and didn't get to say much about it, but talked about how, um, how Jesus uh, heard a Gentile woman and just brushed her off. And I had people looking at me like, I don't remember that story, preacher. And I just thought in my mind, I'm going to have to come back to that because I can see I raised more questions than answered. And then that night, Brother Trevor, Re Trevor Reynolds just preached that story and did a tremendous job with that uh, last Sunday night. So thankful for that. So tonight, we're going to look at another characteristic of God, another attribute of God, and then what we're going to focus on tonight is how that ought to be displayed in our life. Now, Part of this message has already been preached months ago, and so you're going to have to either go back and listen to it again, uh, or, or just listen to this brief introduction and get caught up here. But back toward the beginning of the year, a message was preached that God is self-sufficient. He is a self-sufficient God. And we said what that means is, that God 
needs nothing. God has no needs. Uh, there, there is nothing that is a necessity to God because uh, we're going to read this in just a minute, but all things come from God. Now let me read this quote to you uh, that I brought to the pulpit to read tonight. This is a quote from uh, A.W. Tozer. Now listen to what he says. It, he's, he's writing a prayer here. So this is a prayer to God. This is what Tozer writes. He says, Teach us, O God, that nothing is necessary to Thee. Were anything necessary to Thee, that thing would be the measure of Thine imperfection. And how could we worship one who is imperfect? If nothing is necessary to Thee, then no one is necessary to And if no one, then certainly not we. You ever think about that? Uh, Listen, this is going to offend somebody, but that's okay. God doesn't need us to be God. Now I'm going to go back and preach a little bit from months ago, but think about this. Every other false God that is worshipped on this planet needs worshippers for that God to exist. (laughs) If the worshipers all passed away, so would the God. Because those gods need worshipers for their very existence. But God doesn't need us. He wants us. He loves us. He cares about us. He desires our worship, but He doesn't need our worship. To exist. He is self-sufficient. You say that's because he's got those angels up in heaven that praise him night and day. And they do. And he is worthy. But he doesn't need angels praising him to be God. He has everything he needs because he is the source of all things. So Tozer said, if nothing is necessary to thee, then no one is necessary. And if no one, then certainly not we. Thou thou dost seek us, though. Thou dost not need us. We seek thee because we need thee. For in thee, and he quotes from the book of Acts here, we live and move and have our being. Isn't that good? i got to read that one more time, that last part. Thou dost seek us, though thou dost not need us. We seek thee because we need thee, for in thee we live and move and have our being. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and uh, verse number 17. Most people can quote this, probably in here tonight, but 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This is a phrase that gets skipped over a lot, but it's so important in verse number 18. And all things are of God. Well, preacher, what's that mean? Well, I'm going to take a stab at at, at, uh, explaining this, okay? It means that all things are of God. That's what it means. You say that everything that is came from God? Ultimately, yes. Without God, there is nothing. Take your Bible, turn to John chapter 1 with me tonight. Turn to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now I can go on, i got a lot more scriptures here, but that would be going back months ago and preaching that message. we got to get on to what we're focusing on tonight, that God is self-sufficient because All things are of God. All things come from God. Therefore, He doesn't need to gain anything 
outside of himself. All right, go back to 2 Corinthians. Keep your Bible handy tonight. We're going to use it. 2 Corinthians. In chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> he says in verse number 3, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the holy, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now God is, by all definition, independent. He is independent. He doesn't need a thing. He doesn't need anybody. And tonight I am not going to preach that because God is independent and He lives within me, that I should be independent. Because how could I preach that when Jesus said, Without me ye can do nothing. How can I preach that when Paul said, uh, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now, I'm not going to preach how you and I need to be independent now that we're children of God, but what I am going to preach is this. We need to learn what source to be dependent on. There's some things we need to grow independent from and become dependent on the right source. I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag here. The right source is God Himself. We must be dependent upon God, but in our dependence upon God, we need to learn to be independent of all other sources. Let's pray and we're going to get into this. Heavenly Father, uh, I'm asking you, God, to help us tonight. I pray that you'd help me to say that which I must, and I pray that you'd just forbid me by your Spirit from saying anything that I shouldn't tonight. And God, I want to trust you for that. I want to ask you to... Use the message to speak to hearts tonight and, and just confirm truth in us. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll just jump right into this with both feet real quick, okay? The Bible teaches us, and because of all we got to cover, I don't, I don't have time to, to go everywhere that we need to. I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards. But the Bible teaches us that whoever we become dependent on, we become a servant to. Whoever you are dependent on, you become a servant to. And I'm just going to tell you that a lot of entities, individuals, and institutions, I almost alliterated that. I didn't even mean to. It was totally accidental. But a lot of entities, individuals, Institutions that people depend on for their sufficiency are horrible masters. Unstable masters. Sometimes even wicked and evil intentioned masters. And I don't mind telling you because I love the congregation that I get to preach to. The government is a horrible master. I understand there are people that have to depend upon subsistence from the government, but I encourage anybody that I can to seek God as much as they can for the opportunity to one day bid that master farewell and get your freedom under God and serve Him and Him alone because, and I'm, I'm talking about the United States government, is a horrible master. <laughs> A horrible master. I told you this wasn't going to be politically correct. I'm definitely getting canceled after this, okay? But you don't cancel me. You just stay with me, all right? We'll be okay. We'll be okay. 
You say, preacher, are you against all government programs and things like that? I am not. I, 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 I'm just telling you honestly. I'm not against a government of the people, by the people, for the people. That helps people. I don't mind that at all. But I am biblically minded against a government that seeks to own people by handing out resources that that government does not possess in the first place. Because not only does that put the people that are dependent on, that, on those resources in bondage, but it puts the people that are paying for it in bondage as well. And it's the surest way to a lack of freedom. It absolutely is. You say, well, preacher, then what is the alternative? Well, the alternative always has been and always will be a God who can be depended upon. People ought not be taught to trust in the handouts of a governmental system but they ought to be taught to trust in a true and living God who can provide my every need and your every need as well. He absolutely can. If God is self-sufficient and all things are of God, I don't need the middleman of a government to provide my needs. And they do a very poor job of it, by the way. Uh, there's always strings attached. And I don't want to be under those strings. I would rather be provided for by a God who cares. Now, God's care takes on different forms in different situations. Let me just help you here. In 1 first, in first Timothy chapter 5, there are certain people that fall into need and it is God's plan that their sufficiency, that their care come from their family. Family is one of the means by which God is, is able to provide sufficiency for those He loves. So much so that He says that the family ought to step in and meet the needs to the point that the church should not be charged. That's what the Bible says. Now it's not about the church saving a buck. Because the church certainly needs to be uh, yet another means by which God helps take care and, and helps meet needs. But, but I, I'm going to tell you, nowhere in Scripture will you find where the church is to become a welfare system that actually works. They tried it. <laughs> you ever read in the book of Acts where they tried it? They tried full-blown communism. I'm not making that up. Just go read the first several chapters of the book of Acts. And here's, here's what happened. Holy Ghost indwelled them and they were excited and they were pumped up and they said, hey, we don't care about earthly possessions. We don't care about money. And that's the way every spirit-filled child of God ought to be. We should not care about personal resources. It should not be our goal. It should not be our passion, our fervor. We should see all resources that God's blessed us with as tools that are to be used in His service one way or another for our own provision or for the provision of others. And if God blessed us one time, He can bless us again. Some of the most blessed Christians I've ever seen in my life were also the most benevolent Christians, the most giving Christians. Because God sold somebody that he could trust with money not to build bigger barns and not to hoard it to themselves but to be liberal with it and to be giving with it and to be generous with it. And God said, here's somebody I can trust with some finances and I'm telling you, boy, does he trust them. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But in the first few chapters of the book of Acts, Everybody sold everything that they owned and brought the price of everything they sold and came laid it at the apostles' feet. And they had all things communism. I added the last part of the word. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means this. 
that the apostles were in charge of delivering out to every man as they had need. Every household as they had need. That is communism. And they did that in the early church because they were just so... They, they so had the right perspective of worldly goods. And I'm going to tell you right now, if it was just us and the Spirit of God that lives within us, it would work. But it can't work because it ain't just us and the Spirit of God. There's a flesh too. And that flesh messes it up every time. As long as there's sin, communism will never work. Because somebody's going to keep back part of their price. And somebody's not going to contribute like they should. And somebody's going to back off on living a productive life because it's just going to short the, the pot and then you know everybody's affected by that. No, if we were living, not looking at earthly resources and just following the Spirit of God and everybody worked as unto the Lord every time we go to work and everybody did a productive job and I say that because I am firmly convinced there are jobs today that aren't productive at all. So if you're going to work, you ought to produce something for the good of other people. Work ought to be productive work. It ought to provide something, some good, some service that's worth some value. And, and, and if we were just following the Spirit of God and there was no flesh and there was no sin, then we, everybody would contribute the maximum amount that they could produce as unto the Lord, and then it would be divided uh, in equity among all of the constituents, and everything would work, but it has never worked, and it will never work as long as there's sin. That's a fact. And socialism is just a mamby-pamby method of communism. And it doesn't work either. It's been proven in countries who have tried it, over and over again, and it just absolutely does not work. Because where sin is in the picture, man will not contribute the maximum amount, but he will demand the maximum amount. <laughs> That's a problem. So the church found out by chapter 6. That didn't take long. They only started it in chapter 2. They made it to chapter 6 and found out that doesn't work. It'd be better off if everybody just worked held on to their own stuff and gave as the Lord impressed it upon their heart to do so. That's how the church was taught in the latter chapters of the New Testament, like when it came to giving to the saints at Jerusalem in 2 Corinthians, and it was as every man purposed in their heart, so let him give. Because that works a whole lot better than just everybody bring it to me and I'll make sure everybody's got what they need. Uh-uh. I don't want that job as pastor. I don't want to be the financial dispensary of South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church. It's quiet in here. I'm thankful that God has our church in a position where we do get to help people from time to time. That's a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to help people. I also know because I get to be the pastor here, that there are times where, it, yes, it is through the church, but in an individual sort of way, God just puts it upon somebody's heart to be a blessing to somebody. And maybe God's given a little excess to somebody here, and instead of them saying, Woo, I got me some excess, they said, All right, God, where do you want it to go? And they just reach out. And I've, I've had people hand me something and say, Hey, could you give this to somebody? And, and don't worry about telling them where it came from or anything like that. Just tell them it's from the Lord. Uh, doesn't bother me a bit. Doesn't bother me a bit. I'm glad, I'm glad we have a church that cares and looks out for the needs of others and tries to be a help in that. But I got news for you. You're going to run into some sufficiency issues at times. And God doesn't want you depending on your family. And God doesn't want you depending on your church. God wants your full attention. And God says, this is me and you. I want you 
to depend on me. And we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Children of God here tonight, I hope you're listening. Because God's going to take you through these lessons from time to time. And He doesn't want the first thought that comes to your mind to be, who's available to bail me out? He wants you to come to Him and say, God, I want my sufficiency to be of you. And I'm just going to tell you, this is... I, I, I thank God for some parents who did this in the Decker home when I was just two, three years old. My dad was starting a church in a little rural county called Allen County, Kentucky. County seat there was Scottsville, and he started the Berean Baptist Church there. And I'm telling you, they uh, got a building and invited people, and in the first week there were 200 people going to church there. No, that's a lie. It's a lie. It was slow. It was tough. See, people in Allen County, Kentucky, they don't change. They don't move. They've done things for hundreds of years. And they're almost like a, oh, what would you call it? A, a show me. And it was going to take somebody to come in there and stay. And not go anywhere. I'm talking about year after year. Regardless of what the attendance was. Church doors are still open. Singing still going on. Preaching still going on. But there were some tough times in that. There were some times when the Decker family had, <clears throat> had no food in the house. And I remember I preached about the cereal aisle this morning, so I'm going to convict myself right here. But I remember me and my sister Angie, she's three years older than I am, me and my sister Angie somehow caught wind of a new cereal that was out called Smurf Berry Crunch. <laughs> Smurf Berry Crunch. Anybody remember the Smurfs? Yeah. And they, they came out with Smurf Berry Crunch. Man, that looked like the best cereal anybody could ever eat. And we asked mom and dad for Smurf Berry Crunch, but the cereal that we ate at that time in the Decker household didn't come in a cardboard box. It came in the big bag down on the bottom. You understand what I mean? We, we were in the bag cereal at that point. And they didn't make Smurf Berry Crunch in the bags. That was in the box. And my dad would say this so often to me and my sister and to all of us kids growing up. Son, if that's a desire of your heart, We'll just pray about it. I didn't know what was going on at the time, but Dad was teaching me that my sufficiency was of God. And I didn't have to depend on anybody but Him. So you might imagine the surprise on me and Angie's face when my parents took us to a preacher's meeting. They had regular monthly preachers fellowships and, and we went to one of those preachers meetings just like we did every month. Except this time when we came back out to our big blue station wagon to drive back to Allen County, somebody had put boxes of groceries in the back of that station wagon and sticking out of the top of one of those boxes was Smurf Berry Crunch. And you might think that's a foolish story, but to a two, two or three year old young man who had been told by his dad, son, if that's something you desire, pray about it. I knew God did that. I can't tell you how many times that's helped me. I don't think the Smurf Berry Crunch helped me at all. I'm pretty sure it's like most cereals, it was a disappointment. But the fact that I could want something and ask God for it and He would provide it, that taught me something at a very young age. And anymore, anymore we're, kids are way more inclined to grow dependent on mom and dad's credit card than they are a God who's in heaven, who all things are made by Him and was not anything made that wasn't made. I'm just saying we can 
learn and we should learn and we better learn to depend upon God. I'm just going to tell you in case you don't know this that the government cannot maintain what they're doing. It will fail. It will collapse. And you better start now learning how to depend on God because He never fails and He will never collapse. He's eternal. We can depend on Him. Don't start acting like you're, you don't need anybody. No, you do. But you also don't need to act like you need everybody. Hang on, let me say that again. We shouldn't act like we don't need anybody. But neither should we act like we need everybody. We just need God. We're going to finish up here in 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. I want to read to you tonight the story of one of the meanest preachers you've ever heard of in your life. It's, I mean, y'all know preachers can be mean, right? Just no compassion whatsoever. And I'm going to read to you a story about a mean preacher. Watch what happens here. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse number 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant... My husband is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. Now, out right here in the language that she's used, talking to the man of God right here, she's making a case. You can tell it. She, she's, she's buttering him up. She's putting all the necessary details in here. Did you catch that? Thy servant. You're attached to this guy. He's one of the sons of the prophets now. He's been in your class. Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. So she makes a case. Hey, you know he loved God. He feared God. He was a good man. She's making a case here. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Now that's how the credit card companies did back then. When you didn't pay your bill, they came and took your kids and put them to work until the debt was paid off. You say, I don't think that'll ever fly today, preacher. Well, it might not, but that's what they did back then. So not only has she lost her husband. Now this is a serious situation. I'm not making light of it. She's lost her husband by no fault of her own. She's in a bad situation. The one that God put in her life and family to provide is no longer there anymore. This is a bad situation. And furthermore, he left debts behind, and that's a bad situation. And now they're coming to take her kids to put them to work. So not only has she lost her husband, she's about to lose her kids, and she's in a bad way. And so she, one thing that she does that I can't fault her for at all, she comes to the man of God. She comes to Elisha and she says, she says, and the creditor has come, to take unto, uh, has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Verse number two. And Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for thee? <laughs> what? You see why I say this is the meanest preacher that ever was. Now, Jesus does this a few times too. As a matter of fact, I'll refer to last Sunday night's message where the Gentile woman uh, with the daughter uh, came to Jesus and said, Can you heal her? And he said, uh, I've just come for the house of Israel. And then she pressed him a little bit further and he said, It's not fit for me to give the children's food unto dogs. I know that sounds rough. But it's going somewhere. And when this woman comes with a legitimate problem and a legitimate need to the man of God, he responds what seems like crassly and coldly by saying, What shall I do for thee? 
Now, if you think he's saying that, you say, yeah, I don't think you're saying that, reading that with the right tone, preacher. I think he's saying, oh, what shall I do for thee? Well, that doesn't fit with the rest of the verse. No, what he's actually saying is, what do you want me to do about it? And then he turns it right back on her. He says, what do you have in the house? That's what he says. Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house. Isn't that what it says? The handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. You know what this tells me right here? That already she is undervaluing her resources. She's making her case to the man of God and he, he turns it right back to her. She's probably a little bit surprised because I've got a feeling she was coming to him to seek a contribution from the benevolence fund. But when she got to the man of God, he said, What shall I do for thee? What do you have in your own house? She said, I don't have anything in my house save a little pot of oil. Well, let me help you out here with the rest of the story. She did not get a contribution from the benevolence fund. Matter of fact, the man of God didn't do anything for her. What the man of God did for her was taught her and her boys that they could depend on God. She said, he said, well look, God's already given you everything you need then. Here's what you, here's what you do. Now you're going to have to trust God to do this. This is only going to be accomplished by faith. But lady, here's what you're going to have to do. You send your boys out and you borrow vessels, not a few. Anybody know what not a few means? As many as you can. You go out and you borrow vessels, not a few. You bring them into your house. Watch what he says here. I don't, I don't want to mess it up. He says, then, then he said, go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. Time out just a second. You see what he's telling him? This is nobody else's business. This is your business. I could go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 right now and, and read to you where Paul said about the believers in Thessalonica that you let everybody know to do their own business. You don't have to drag everybody else into your business. You can depend on God. You say, well, preacher, I just... I just want to do Galatians 6, you know, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You better keep reading in Galatians chapter 6 because you're going to come across a verse that says, but let every man bear his own burden. Bear ye one another's burdens means when you're in the position to voluntarily put yourself under the load of somebody else's burden, but you better first be willing to bear your own burden. 1 Thessalonians 4, do your own business. He says, you, you borrow vessels, not a few. You go in your house and you shut the door. Because this is between you and your boys and God and nobody else. Now here's what you do. You take that pot of oil, the only thing you've got in your house, and you start pouring it into them vessels that you borrow. He says... He says, uh, and shalt pour out into all those vessels and shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Now, this is why this was a matter of faith. Because if they had gone out and brought, bought, borrowed two vessels, guess how many vessels full of oil they would have had? Two plus whatever they had to start with. That's why he said, if you're going to do it, do it. And it's going to take some work. I mean, you've got to go door knocking. You've got to say, hey, what pots can I borrow? I need a mi Excuse me. She said amen. Uh, 
what pots do you have that are empty that I can borrow? I'm going to bring them back to you, but I need to borrow them, okay? And they carry those in. They carry them. Can you, can you imagine the living room just stacked up with pots everywhere? Kitchen full of empty pots. And she looks at her boys and she says, Boys, i got to be honest with you. I'm scared to death right now. I don't understand how this is going to work. But the man of God said we can depend on God. So let's give it a go. Bring me the vessel. She pours out. Now, now let's just say, she, she got a pot of oil about that big. And they, they bring her one, bring her a big old bowl. She pours out. That thing just keeps pouring. She keeps pouring. She keeps pouring. And it gets full. She says, okay, all right, bring me another one. I mean, there shouldn't be anything in here, but let's give it a go. She's just pouring, pouring, pouring. They're running out of places to set full pots of oil. And I'm just going to tell you, this is how a widow woman and her two sons that were about to go into debt went into the oil industry <laughs> and had enough to pay off all their debts and to live on what was left. Not because somebody gave them a contribution, but because they learned God is able. Amen. That all things are of God. And if you'll trust Him, He'll provide for you. Jesus said it a little bit differently, but He means the same thing in John 15 when He said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. As long as you're attached to me and drawing from me, I'll be everything you need. David said it different still. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. And right on and on through the 23rd Psalm. That's the same writer who also said, I have been young and now I'm old and I've yet to see the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. Listen, we cannot be self-sufficiency. Well, no, we cannot be self-sufficient. Our sufficiency is of God. But as long as you are dependent upon some source other than God, God cannot pour out His blessing. And here's why. Because He's not going to share the glory for what you have in your life. He's not going to share it. You say, that makes God sound like a jealous God. Well, that's probably because He is a jealous God. He said that about Himself. He doesn't have to share His glory with anybody because there's nobody to share his glory with. And so it's not going to be like, now look, I'm going to try this over here, but God's my backup. <clears throat> not going to work. God's not going to be your backup. Well, I'm going to get half of my necessities by depending on God, and I'll get half my necessities over here. <clears throat> it's not going to work like that. Because not, God's not going to have you getting up and, and, and saying, now give me a little bit of time here. I've got a lot of people to think. Think. For my blessings. He's not going to do that. He's not going to share that. He wants us to be dependent solely upon Him as the self-sufficient one. And He wants us to understand that because He is self-sufficient, that our sufficiency is all of Him and we need not look anywhere else. It's been a great blessing to me as a pastor through the years to have people come and say, hey, pastor, I don't have to be on that program anymore. Or I don't have to do this, or I don't have to do that. And it's taken some time. And sometimes it does take some time to, to change over. But there's, there's some people that bless my heart that have said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust God. I'm going to trust God's way. I'm going to do it God's way. And I'm just going to trust Him to provide. And they have found God to provide faithfully so that they didn't need the assistance of anybody else. Isn't that a blessing? It still works. 
Oh, that's one thing I still got to talk about. Work. Did you know that is one of God's main provisions for sufficiency? <laughs> is work. And He never means for work to take the place of Him. But He does give us, in most cases, not in every case, but most people have the ability to do something productive, to earn a wage that is sufficient. You say, well, it's, it's not sufficient to have everything I need. Everything you need or everything you want. There's a difference. There's a preacher in the 70s. I don't know his name or I'd give him the credit, but there was a preacher in the 70s who was preaching out of 2 Kings chapter 4 about this woman that came to Elisha. And he was in the middle of throwing her down. You know what I mean by throwing her down? He was in the middle of throwing her down. And he said this. He said, if there's something you need, let me tell you how to get it. You need to work, and you need to pray, and you need to pray, and you need to work. And you need to work, and you need to pray, and pray, and work. And when work doesn't get it, prayer will. And when prayer doesn't get it, work will. And when neither work nor prayer get it, then forget it because you didn't need it anyway. That's true, isn't it? If we can't get it by productive labor or by prayer, we might want to take that as an answer from God that it's not something we really need. We really need. See, God's got a plan for our sufficiency. You say, preacher, it's awful hard to trust that it's going to work. Well, that's part of it. you got to learn to trust Him. you got to learn to trust Him. And what you'll find is that God's faithful. What you'll find is that the one you are depending on is incredibly dependable. And He will meet every need. Some of the most exciting stories that I have in my life come from times of the greatest need. And instead of going here and here and here and here and try to get it solved, I just took it to the Lord. And when God answered, I knew it was Him. Because nobody else knew about it. Children of God, we need those times in our life. We need those times when our business is our business and nobody else's. So that when God gets in our business, we know it was God. We know He's real. We know He loves us. We know He cares about us. We know He's going to take care of us and provide for us. And He always will. Heavenly Father, thank You tonight for Your Word. Thank You for Your goodness and Your grace. Thank You that You are sufficient.